Master in Emotional and Social Intelligence, Decision Making and Risk Management. His specialty is in helping forward looking leaders concerned about resistance to change. He serves as the CEO of the boutique consulting and training company, Disaster Avoidance Experts. Its methodology transforms negative emotions and resistance to change into positive emotions and commitments by fusing narratives, nudges, and neuroscience. A uh, best-selling author of several traditionally published books, Dr. Glenn is most well-known for his 2019 book, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters. And his 2020 book, uh, The Blind Spots Between Us, How to Overcome Unconscious Cognitive Bias and Build Better Relationships. Um, his groundbreaking thought leadership was featured in over 550 articles, 450 interviews in prominent venues. These include USA Today, Time, Fast Company, CBS News, Fortune, CNBC, Inc. Magazine, and many, many more. Dr. Glenn's expertise comes from 20 years of consulting, coaching, and training. His clients include innovative startups, major nonprofits, and Fortune 500 companies ranging from Aflex to Xerox to Honda to um, uh, Wells Fargo and on and on and on. His expertise also comes from his research background as a behavioral scientist with 15 years in academia, including seven as a professor at Ohio State University. And in his free time, which I can't even understand how he has free time, um, he makes sure to spend abundant quality time with his wife to avoid his personal life turning into a disaster. As I think all of us can appreciate that. Um, and to help all of us take advantage of his groundbreaking expertise, I've asked him to share with us how we can make 2021 a strategic success for our businesses via neuroscience. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Glenn as he likes to be called and uh, away we go. Thank you so much for that warm introduction, Carlo, and welcome everyone. This is, uh, I've done over a hundred of these webinars over the last year, and this is probably the webinar where I regret most not being able to come to Long Island because actually I grew up in New York City and my parents live in Long Island right now. So they live one exit north of JFK, so exit 27 and Belt. So this is, <laughs> I'd really like to visit them when I go to New York. And this would have been a perfect opportunity, but you know, such as life right now, life in the pandemic will make do and maybe sometime later, I'll get to visit you in person. So let's talk about how to make 2021 a strategic success for your business. That's the goal. And we're gonna think about strategy and there'll be an exercise in strategic decision-making. How do you formulate your strategy effectively as an EO member, as an entrepreneur? So this is something we'll talk about. But before we get to that, we'll talk about the common judgment errors we make because of how our mind is wired, because you need to understand these errors that we make in our strategic judgment and all sorts of judgment before you actually take advantage of strategic exercises. So I'll start by talking about something that you don't need to have as an entrepreneur, confidence, be confident. This is something that you've probably heard your whole entrepreneurship career, that confidence is incredibly important for entrepreneurs. And it's certainly very important. It's a critical trait. And it's something that you need to have not only as an entrepreneur, but in other areas. You know, for example, in driving. I, whenever I come visit my parents and go to New York, it takes me about an hour to go from there to New York, to Manhattan. And you need to have some good confidence as a driver in order to be able to make the Belt Parkway successfully and safely. So how good are your driving skills? And that's the first thing I want to talk about and ask, and I'm gonna run a poll where you will see an ability to answer these questions. And I'll, we'll have polling for out just to see how people are doing, how they're thinking about things and what their answers are. So you'll be able to see an opportunity to, to answer the question of how good are your driving skills. So please answer whether they're above average or below average. You know, are you in the bottom half or are you in the top half of drivers? You can think of you know drivers in New York City or whatever. So bottom half or top half. Okay, I see 73% of people voted. I'll give you five more seconds to vote. So make your voice heard. All right. So remarkably, we'll see that everyone in this group is above average. 
<laughs> you might have heard of this as the Lake Wobegon effect, where everyone is above average. And that's what happens, I mean, whenever I do these presentations, this is overwhelmingly the kind of result that I get. There was a study of asking college students whether they're above average drivers or below average drivers. And 94% of them rated themselves as above average drivers, despite them being in college and having very little driving experience. So it's a very, very common phenomenon for us to be pretty confident in our driving, perhaps more confident than we deserve to be. <laughs> and this is a cognitive bias that has to do with confidence, specifically overconfidence. Overconfidence is a pretty dangerous tendency in our strategic judgment. And this is something that is very prevalent in EO circles. So I've been doing, I've been presenting for EO groups for a long time right now. We recently presented to EOLA and many others. I'm going to be presenting to EO Tampa Bay in a bit. And in EO circles, entrepreneurial circles in general, overconfidence bias I've seen as the biggest, biggest problem in good strategic decision making, being too confident about the future. So if folks feel that they are very confident that they make the right decisions, and when they, if they say 100% confident, totally confident, studies show that they're only about right 80% of the time. So 80% of the time, they are right 20% of the time, that means they're wrong. And if it's 100% confident, that means it's a kind of a bet the firm question. You know, I'm so confident I'm gonna bet the company on this question. Well, guess what? There's a reason about half of all startups go bankrupt within the first five years and three quarters go bankrupt within the first 15 years. And overconfidence is one of the biggest, biggest causes. So you've gotta be careful about that overconfidence bias and keep that in mind as one of the dangerous judgment errors that we tend to make. And I'm an entrepreneur myself. I run a six people company called Disaster Avoidance Experts. It's a training, consulting, coaching company as Carlo mentioned kindly. And so it, it's hard for me to not be overconfident as, as well. And I know about this stuff. So it's something I have to work on constantly to restrain my optimism and restrain my confidence about the future and to be more humble about my judgments. And that's very important for making good strategic judgments. So it's especially dangerous for those with experience and authority. The more experience and the more authority you have, and of course, as the leader of a company, as an entrepreneur, you have a lot of authority and you have a lot of experience, you trust your experience. And as we have more authority and experience, we tend to trust our judgment more and more. However, the problem with that situation is that the world changes around us and we tend to use our previous heuristics, our previous ways of making decisions in a changing world. For example, with the pandemic, right? Elon Musk, how, when he tweeted that, you know, hey, the, the, you know, this pandemic panic is dumb in mid-March, and then uh, and he tweeted that on March 9th. And then March 20th, he tweeted that based on current trends, close to zero new cases in the US by the end of April. <laughs> well, he was clearly, clearly clearly wrong because he was making a judgment about a new thing that he was using his old pre-existing notions to make judgments about that. And even though he's the richest man in the world right now, he got that very wrong. And of course, that cost him some money in terms of how Tesla runs and making some decisions around Tesla. So you don't want to be in the same spot. You don't have as much money as Elon Musk and you know, don't have as much money to burn. There's again, so overconfidence bias is something to be really concerned about. And this is part of a broader tendency that entrepreneurs always tend to go with their gut. This is something we've been hearing all our lives. We've been taught, I've been taught that as an entrepreneur when my mentor taught me, you know, go with your gut, follow your intuition. That's not what I actually learned in behavioral science when I spend this time researching these topics. This is a bad idea. Going with your gut, trusting your intuition, following your heart, it sounds good. It feels comfortable. By definition, your gut feels comfortable, but it can lead us into disastrous, disastrous decisions because our gut is actually evolved for the ancient savannah, not the modern world. The gut, what's that about? Well, that's the emotional part of the brain. That is the older part of the brain, the one that evolved for us being in small tribes of 15 people to 150 people, being hunters, gatherers, and foragers. So for example, the way we respond to threats, our primary response to threats, you've probably heard of this, is the fight or flight response. And so when we make decisions, overwhelmingly, we tend to have this fight or flight response to decisions. 
And that's a bad idea. We were very tempted to make decisions very quickly and either in an aggressive posture or in defensive posture, either in an optimistic perspective or a pessimistic perspective. Entrepreneurs like myself and like you tend to overwhelmingly be more optimistic and that and overconfident about their perspectives. And that tends to lead them down the wrong paths. You want to be aware of what this is about. Our brain makes dangerous judgment errors called cognitive biases. That's what they're described as because of how it's wired, because of our evolutionary background. And they comes again from evolutionary background for what our emotional brain evolved for and just the structure of our brain, the way that we can process information. So I'm gonna to go to the poll again and you will see a question. I want to ask you about whether you ever felt very confident that a major decision is wrong, is right, but it turned out to be seriously wrong. I had that happen to me when I hired an assistant manager for my company. That was something that I felt she, I promoted her from the ranks. I felt she was going to do a really good job and it turned out to be pretty disastrous. She turned out to be very much a micromanager as a manager and she couldn't really separate herself from her previous role. And so that was really difficult and pretty wrong decision on my part. So please vote of whether something like that ever happened to you. So we see 76% of the people voted and let's get a couple more. Let's give folks five more seconds. All right. So we see that this overwhelmingly happened to the folks on this call. So lucky for the whoever is the one person to whom it didn't happen, that's great. But the overwhelming majority, over 90% of the people on the call, this happened to. So this is an, an example of where cognitive biases cause you to make the wrong decisions, like they caused me to make the wrong decision. All right. So let's talk a little bit about learning more about what these cognitive biases are. And you can do that using an assessment on dangerous judgment errors in the workplace, which I'll show and we'll go through in a bit. It focuses on the 30 most dangerous cognitive biases in professional settings, all sorts of professional settings, including startups like most of like you're running. It evaluates their extent and the impact of these cognitive biases in your workplace and then it provides you the next steps for addressing them. So I'll show you the assessment using screen share. And what I want you to do is open up chat because we'll be using up the chat feature for this part of the presentation. So please open up your chat and engage that way. At this point, you should all be able to see my screen. And you can see that this assessment and the next steps on dangerous judgment errors in the workplace. So just goes through the instructions. So directions. Each of these questions refers to a problem that might occur in everyday professional settings. So it doesn't talk about you know, overconfidence bias. It doesn't ask you about that. It asks you about something that actually happens is a behavior, is a pragmatic, useful thing that you want to address. Your problem, your goal, so is to indicate how often this problem that described by the assessment actually occurred in your workplace over the past year. So that's your goal. And that would be the goal for anyone else you have to take the assessment. I'll send you the assessment after the presentation. So that's the goal. The answer for each question will be in percentage terms. So percentage terms out of all the possible times this problem might have occurred. If you're doing this assessment, you know, with a focus on specific organizational department, you can do that, but you don't want to overthink it. Just go with your initial impression. So it doesn't have to be precise. Hold on for a second. Some kind of issue with a red line. All right, so let's take a look at the assessment. Now, and we'll be using the chat feature as I mentioned, so open up your chat. So for question number one, think about all the projects in your company. What percentage of them missed the deadline or went over budget in the last year? I have folks when doing EO groups tell me anything from 10% to 90%. So please just put it down. So Boaz sets 50% for his company, 15 for Andrew, 60% uh, for Andrew, near rarely 0%, AJ 40%. Mm -hmm. Let's get a few more folks. 
45 percent 60 percent 50 percent so yeah so this is kind of the typical range that i see in eo groups this is you're running this enterprise pretty young enterprise and you have not you're not as well calibrated as you could be older when i give this presentation in fortune 500 companies they get tend to get lower numbers now if you're getting in the you know, 0 10 20 percent it's not a big deal it's happens if you're if you're getting in the 20 to 30 percent range that's somewhat more serious if you're getting above 30 percent especially in the 40 percent and 50 percent that becomes really serious because you're misallocating resources and of course you're not getting to what you should be getting to that's a big problem of time and deadline and deadlines so this is called the planning fallacy uh, that's the cognitive bias when we make a plan especially for entrepreneurs uh Davin, no, you're not able to see the whole questionnaire. I'll, I'll send you the questionnaire later. So we're just going through one, questions one by one. So we are able to, uh, as entrepreneurs, you're making a plan and you feel that everything is going to go according to plan. You're confident about it, overconfident, unfortunately. We, there's a saying, you know, fail, make up a Failing to plan is planning to fail. Failing to plan is planning to fail. You probably heard this saying. It's pretty common in entrepreneurial circles. It's unfortunately a misleading phrase because in the idea is that, well, you make a plan, everything will go fine. That's the idea of the phrase. Not the case. When you look at the research in behavioral science, a much better way of thinking about planning is failing to plan for problems is planning to fail. So again, failing to plan for problems is planning to fail. You should plan for problems and then you can be able, you're going to be much better able to address any problems in your plans. So that's the first one. Let's go to the second one. Number two, what percentage of team conflicts here occurred because someone overestimated how persuasive they are, so how effective they are in their communications? So please go ahead. Of all team conflicts, you know, however many occur, you know, 20, 50, what percentage occurred because someone overestimated how effective they are in communicating and persuading others? So Nure, 100%, 60%, from Boaz, others folks? Madeline says 10%, Carlo, 45%, Andrew, 0%. Mm -hmm. Mark, 30%, Stephen, 50%, AJ, 70%. Cool, yeah, so again, all over the map and it depends, and this is why it's important to take the assessment, Davy, 80%. This is why it's important to take the assessment and see which of these problems are the biggest for you. So for Andrew had zero on this one, but uh, had a higher number on the previous one. So he had 60 on the previous one. Nure had 0% on this one and 100% on, had 0% on the previous one and 100% on this one. So the assessment allows you to identify which of the cognitive biases that we're talking about is a big problem, is a bigger problem for your corporation. And again, same principle. If it's in the 10 to 20%, it's not a big deal. If it's getting above that, it becomes, you know, 20 to 30% becomes a bigger deal. If it's in the 40s, you definitely want to address it. This is called the illusion of transparency. When we communicate, we feel that we're very good communicators. That's what our gut tells us. We feel that we're getting our message across very effectively, and it's natural for us to feel that way. Well, that's not the reality of the situation. In our modern technological world, who knows what kind of technical glitches are happening on Zoom while you're using Zoom, right? That's one issue. But there's a lot of other issues. People may not be paying their full attention to you. They might be distracted you know, while you're having a virtual meeting. They might be looking at the phone or something or preoccupied with something else. So their kids might be playing in the background. Or even if you're meeting them in person, they might be thinking about an important meeting they'll be having later or what they're going to have for lunch. And of course, they're interpreting whatever you're saying through their own filters. And that's another source of miscommunication. You might be saying one thing, but they're hearing another. I mean, how many people have felt that a prospect has definitely going to make the sale, that you're going definitely going to make the sale to the prospect, you feel very confident, and then you know, it actually turns out you're not making the sale and the prospect you know, moves away from you and chooses somebody else. 
And of course, there were signals that the prospect was going to do that and what the prospect was saying, but it's hard to pay attention to those signals if you don't want to hear them. Let's look at the next one. And you're already familiar with this one. It's about the confidence bias. Of all significant decisions, in what percentage of cases was someone overconfident about the decision? So of all significant decisions over the last year, in what percentage of, con of cases was someone, whether it's you or whether it's somebody else in your company, overconfident about the decision? So new race says 75%. Boaz, 70%. Andrew says 10%. Madeline, 20%. Carla, 25%. Great, Stephen, 50%. Mark, 5%. Uh, 10%. Debbie, 5%. John, 25%. Yeah, so again, so it's different ranges, and some people clearly it's more of a problem. If it's in the 10 to 20%, yeah, you know, 5%, that's fine. Getting 10 into 20 to 30, that's more of a moderate problem. If it's 40% and above, that's a serious problem. And that you definitely want to address uh, this overconfidence, which is, as we saw from the first question where everyone here is an above average driver, it's a pretty common phenomenon. All right. So now we'll go to a poll again. And I want to ask you, if you think that take, this is, these are the first three out of 30 questions and the rest are like this, would taking this assessment and addressing the cognitive bias that you uncover there help you make more profitable decisions? Please go ahead. See about a third of the people voted. Let's get the rest voting. All right, give folks five more seconds to make their voice heard. All right, okay, so we see pretty clear unanimity that this would be definitely helpful in making more profitable decisions, which of course is what this presentation is about. How do you make your business more profitable over this coming year? How do you make it more successful? And this is the first half. This is the first idea, the, the first, key. You want to address these cognitive biases. You want to know what they are, what kind of problematic tendencies there are in your business, and how do you address them. And then the assessment has that. So it talks about the next steps in addressing them. All right. Then I will go into a specific technique once you you can use this before you have people take the assessment if you're focusing on strategic planning right at this moment. But ideally, you would take the assessment and figure out what your cognitive biases are first before using this technique to address your strategic planning. Make sure that your strategic planning is effective going forward. It's a technique called Defend Your Future and it has eight steps. And we'll go through each of these steps in turn. You first decide on the scope and goals of your strategy, what you're trying to do and what you want to accomplish. So you want to decide in the area. You can do your whole enterprise, of course, so do your whole business, or you can do a specific part of it, like let's say the sales strategy or the operation strategy, so the or you know, hiring strategy. Then the scope. Within sales, you can do all sorts of sales, or you can focus on sales to a specific type category of client, let's say manufacturing client or finance client, whatever clients you might be working with. Or in operations, you can sort of focus on a certain product if you have more than one product that you're offering. And then you want to draw out the strategic goals. What goals do you want to accomplish? Here, it's really helpful to create a narrative of the future. Think about the new future at the timeline that you want it to be. So you want to decide on the timeline, whether it's six months to 60 months. So you don't go more than 60 months, meaning five years. Well, we, research shows that really going more than five years is very hard to predict. It's already, it's already harder to predict the longer out you go, but five years is really the maximum. So what do you want the area to be like in five years? Let's say you focus on your whole enterprise. What do you imagine your enterprise, your company to be like in five years? So what will it be like? Create a narrative, write it out. What is your vision? What is that future vision of your strategic goals? Or if you focus on, let's say, your sales goals for finance companies, what does that look like within five years? So focus on that, 
write that out the timeline. Now keep in mind that the longer timeline, you'll have less accuracy. It's just the nature of the beast, right? Who could predict the pandemic, but that is an example of why you'll have less accuracy. So you need more resources to address uncertainty and that you'll need to reserve more resources as part of the strategic exercise in order to address the greater uncertainty you'll have over that time. Next, gather the stakeholders. Who are going to be the key stakeholders that you have who will be making a decision? Ideally, four to six people. So you don't want more than four to six people. This, uh, this, uh, you don't want more than 10 people, ideally four to six people. So I was doing a strategic pivot for a startup. It's larger, it's an EO startup, but it's larger than most. It has 500 people. It's 1.4 billion in uh, valuation. So it's a pretty large startup. It's a late stage startup there on their F round of uh, investments. So pretty late. And they wanted as part of their strategic pivot to have not only the executive team, which is six people, but they also wanted the next level of 25 people more to be in the meeting. And that's just not doable. So we've really, we negotiated and ended up being eight people and that was okay. But ideally four to six people. So that's the kind of thing that you wanna be thinking about. You want a balance of expertise and authority. If you're doing your whole company, then you want just the top leadership as we did with a strategic pivot for this large company. If you're doing something like your sales strategy to finance companies, you want a couple of salespeople not sales managers, of course, sales VP, but also a couple of sales people in the room who have expertise, who could provide input. And of course, you want to really think about an independent facilitator. So somebody from the your EO group, a fellow EO member who you trust, who can be a peer, someone like that, someone who is, a, if you have a business coach, consultant of some sort, you want someone who has facilitation skills and who's able to facilitate the meeting. You don't want to do this yourself if you can help it because it's going to be quite difficult for you to address the nature of the topic that you're talking about while also managing the process. So you really want someone else to manage the process. Next, what is the anticipated future? What does the future look like if there are no major changes? You know, nothing like the pandemic happens, nothing, you know, just the straight line happens and everything looks good. If everything goes as you anticipate, that's how many resources would you require for that? And this is what most strategic plans do. This is the steps, th these are the steps for most strategic plans. What would the future look like without major changes? How many resources would you require? And then how do you operationalize this? That is a strategic plan for large majority of strategic plans. That's a bad idea because as you've already learned, we tend to be overconfident and plans often don't go according to plan with a planning fallacy. So failing to plan for problems is planning to fail. So you don't want to stop here. You want to go and address potential problems as well as potential opportunities. So first, unanticipated problems. What kind of problems might arise? Write them out anonymously. This is another reason you want an independent facilitator so that you can have this person gather the data that you all present and address it in an anonymous way. When uh, not, the, not the last startup, the strategic pivot one, but a previous one before the pandemic when I was doing this for a startup that was launching a, its second product. So it made a product, made a second product, I was launching the second product and we were doing an evaluation of this. And here, this was a really important area to do anonymous evaluation. And this is the reason why, because one of the potential problems that was written out was that, well, you know, the, this problem will, this product launch will fail because the new sales VP hates the guts of the operations VP and the, they brought in a sales VP from the outside uh, recently. So that was a problem, obviously, that was, you know, might really hurt the product launch and that you don't want the, that you don't want this issue to arise. And that was very important. So this is it, to address, and we did address it in the meeting, but this is why you want problems written out anonymously. Next, 
estimate what is the likelihood of each one and the impact of each one. You know, the pandemic was something that was very much predictable. A number of very smart people like Bill Gates were talking about the serious possibility. I mean, he gave a TED talk on this as a, the serious possibility of a pandemic and the need to prepare for this. So there's gonna be, obviously if there's a pandemic, it's a large impact. The likelihood of any given year having a pandemic is small. So you want to estimate the likelihood and the impact of each and then multiply them by each other to estimate the what is the most serious problem that you are gonna be working on. And then brainstorm solutions. What kind of solutions can you have? I mean, for a pandemic, obviously there's pandemic insurance, which is not the same thing as business continuity insurance. Business continuity insurance is essentially a form of property casualty insurance. It doesn't really help you with the pandemic, as I'm sure many of you discovered, but there's ways to buy riders on the business continuity insurance like pandemic insurance, which would be a way of addressing this. So this is a way that could pandemic a number of people who went through this process or similar processes address the pandemic effectively. So you wanna identify the resources needed to solve the problems like money for the insurance or something like that, and then update your strategic plan with this new information. So that's what you wanna do. That's the first step. Then unanticipated opportunities, internal to your company and external the, to your company, you wanna be thinking about not simply problems, but solutions. Write them out anonymously for the same reasons and estimate the likelihood and the impact of each one. Determine what are the most promising opportunities and brainstorm ideas to bring them about and seize them. So for the company, the late stage startup that were for whom I was doing a strategic pivot, they determined that one of what, what they do is they provide for their customers that provide sales engagement software. And that's, that's their business. So they determined that a great opportunity for them would be to provide a pivot package for their customers who wanted to do something like what they're doing then in their sales strategy, of course, really important during the pandemic. And they, at, the, at our strategic retreat session, they determined that, hey, this is a great opportunity. And they decided to shift some of their resources from working on their current priorities into working on a strategic pivot package to offer their customers. So you want to identify the resources needed to seize these opportunities. And these were the programming resources, pretty big shift. And you want to update your strategic plan with this new information. Then think about dangerous judgment errors. Check for relevant cognitive biases using the assessment for dangerous judgment errors in the workplace, which we already went through. And then unknown unknowns. This is a big area which, I mean, EO members, entrepreneurs really don't plan nearly enough for unknown unknowns, major disruptors. They really come pretty frequently. I mean, if you think about it, you know, the last decade, we had the 2008, 2009 fiscal crisis. Now, about a decade later, we have the pandemic. Who knows what will happen next? You want to identify what will happen what might happen for you and your key stakeholders. So this is something, this is a really critical area. And this is where, you know, with the pandemic, you can buy pandemic insurance. You, there are various ways you can protect yourself against them. What kind of resources are needed to address these? You know, there's, for example, if a solar flare happens, it, it knocks out some satellites. That might be problematic for your ability to work from home. There's a lot of fair things that can happen. And so you want to protect yourself, resources you need to address these. And you want to add 40% to account for truly unpredictable events, something that Bill Gates has not talked about yet, but that can happen. <laughs> so you want to add that to your unknown unknowns budget and just have that on reserve to address these unknown unknowns. And consider how to make your plans more flexible and resilient to address these unknown unknowns. And that, I, I have to say, for I have a number of companies that were getting back to me after we made this after I did them these strategic retreats over the last couple of years before the pandemic, who are really grateful that they put in some money on reserves for right now for the pandemic. It, it really saved their butts. So this is something to take seriously. And finally, communicate and take the next steps. Communicating effectively to various shareholders about the results of this exercise and reserve the resources that are needed to conduct this exercise effectively. Uh, as conducting, after conducting the exercise effectively, reserve the resources that were needed afterward and take the next steps, whatever you decide to communicate and communicate and so on. Great, okay. Uh, there was something I noticed that James Kanzler said 
that confidence for an entrepreneur is like the electricity for a refrigerator. I hear you, James, and that's a nice sentiment. It's important to have confidence, but this is a very, very dangerous thing where you feel too confident, overconfident. This is again why startups, half of all startups fail, and you know, within five years, at thirty and seventy-five percent fail within fifteen years. Do you want to be in that fifty percent and within in five years, or that's seventy-five uh, percent in fifteen years? Well, no, out, uh, Napoleon not. Hill from uh, in a book called Outwitting the Devil talks about fear as controlling you. Mm -hmm. And when you fear, you, you kind of uh, are stuck and you don't do anything and have indecision. And sometimes I feel that making a decision, any decision is even better than no decision at all. And mm -hmm. so when you talk about overanalyzing yourself, sometimes you can get into uh, a situation where you get paralyzed. Parallels, yes, analysis paralysis is a big problem. And that's one of the cognitive biases that the assessment talks about. It's called information bias, when we look for too much information. So you want to decide for each decision, what kind of information, how much of it do you need? If you're making a bet the, com you know, bet the company decision, you definitely want to spend a lot of time, get a lot of, uh, put a lot of attention to it. If it's a less important decision, you don't want to spend as much time on it. So you want to decide what information is important and then how much of it together. You don't want to go too far. So that you, want, you don't want to get stuck in analysis paralysis, but having a little bit of fear is actually a quite healthy thing from the research on successful entrepreneurs. This is how entrepreneurs actually succeed quite effectively. They I look a little around. bit of fear, I guess, yes. right? correct, yep. a little bit of fear, because that, that's right. That, that makes sense. But I think yep. what kind that, of what you're saying is almost a little bit over overstating that, in my opinion. I hear what you're saying. I mean, and I state this very clearly based on the research on the most successful entrepreneurs. The most successful entrepreneurs, there's a reason again, like I'm saying, why half of all startups fail within the first within the first five years, three quarters fail within the first 15 years. I'm sure you've heard the statistic because overconfidence really dooms a lot of good startups before they become profitable. And you don't want to be in that position. You want to have fear enough that you use effective techniques like take the assessment and use the use the defend your future technique. Because if you don't have sufficient fear, you'll just go with your gut and feel you know, you're doing the right thing. And that will often lead to a disaster. If you don't go with your gut, who are you going to go with? Someone else's gut? You use defective decision-making techniques like this one. This is this is what you go with. Your gut, our guts have been we shown to be... Crystal, we don't have crystal balls for the future. We don't know exactly what's going to happen. So sometimes and you don't need to. You don't need to, James. You do the best analysis you can, but at some point you say, you know what? I'm going to go for it. I'm trusting my gut. I'm trusting mm. what, what inside is telling me what to do. And I, and I have the confidence and I go at it with vigor. I think- I hear what you're saying, and that's a great Bruce quote from Napoleon Hill. Hey, Bruce hey, 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 James, 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 right, James. That's a great quote from Napoleon Hill, and a lot of gurus tell you to do the same thing, and that's great for them. They make a lot of money saying that, and it feels good to our gut. It feels good to us. You know, we like that message, right? It feels good to have confidence and go at it. And that's when we run off the cliff like the road runner. And we don't realize that we're not that, you know, when we look below us, that that's when we're falling. You want to be aware of that and you want to address these cognitive biases. So this is something that you need to be thinking about going forward. All right. Great folks. So let's go into groups. I'm gonna do breakout groups where you will discuss how you can incorporate defend your future as a strategic planning technique into what you're doing right now or elements of it to make your 2021 a successful year. And that includes, of course, the assessment for question number six, but the whole technique of thinking about your strategy and going forward. So five minutes for breakout groups. What you'll see as I start, as I create breakout groups is you'll see the an opportunity to join the breakout group and then you will see a, you will see eventually a time clicking down that indicates it's the end of breakout groups all right so you'll have so click on the button that says join breakout group right now
James, let me know if you're having a technical issue or if there's some, or if you're focusing on something else right now. So you should be able to see a, a button on your screen that says join a breakout, join the group. Okay, good. You know, break it down into soluble uh, little pieces. So uh, it's definitely something we're concentrating on and I, I find it helpful. You find so. it, you know, AJ, I know you're, you, you know, part of your business is, is in the world of healthcare. You know, do you, do you, um, how do you scenario plan for that? Like, how do you, how do you think about how that might affect, like, how did the pandemic, like, could you have ever anticipated something as dramatic impacting the business, either positively or negatively? Well, I think in the early stages, uh, nobody knew what, what to expect, clearly. I mean, certainly the leadership and the, top, the scientists, the politicians, nobody really knew what to anticipate. And for the first time in 25 years, Right at the beginning, I was very, very concerned that my good. <laughs> now I don't think I formally met a few people. Um, I see Andrew's name. Who? Who's yeah. Andrew? How are you? My name is John. Um, John. I'm fairly nice new. I'm a month in, so I just wanted. Oh, to okay. Yeah, yeah. Stuff. John just joined. Yeah. Thanks, John. Okay. Nice to meet you. Nice, meet nice you. to meet you. I have a plastics manufacturing company. Uh, oh, great. Cool. Yeah, great. So thoughts great. about the. Well, how you can use this in your companies? Well, we were just trying to figure that out. And, and one thing I like is not to have to go with my gut. And if there's an analysis, because I do analysis paralysis big time. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I make a lot of decisions on growth decisions within my, my company is very old. Mm. Um, I've been here 30 years and the company 70 oh. years old. Um, but the reason we're still here is we make a lot of gamble choices mm -hmm. on a monthly basis on how to grow a company, you know, investment choices. So we sure. make a lot of investment. Um, and it's without a doubt, it's like James says, I, you know, have been using my gut and we have had failures and we've obviously, I want to say, knock on wood, we've had more successes than failures, but I'd like to- it wouldn't be here otherwise, right? Yeah, it wouldn't be, exactly. So yeah. I'd, I'd love to take the gut out, like you're mm -hmm. saying, and, and have a little more analysis um, mm -hmm. and, and use your questionnaire to see if I'm, not even picking up on everything, which I'm sure I'm not. I don't want to be the only one to make all the decisions either. So if we can figure out a way for everybody to know where the issues are or mm -hmm. problems, that might be a good thing. I don't know. Yeah, and you can't, do, of course, there are some questions that are going to be, once you gather some data, you'll have to make a call. But the problem is that I've seen so many entrepreneurs not gathering nearly enough data. I mean, how much data did Elon Musk have before saying that, well, you know, close to zero new cases by the end of April, right? <laughs> well, that right. very public statement where he made some investments in Tesla based on this that really turned out pretty bad for Tesla. Uh, it was really a bad- but Also, a lot of people told him he could never uh, create a space company. He's crazy. Of course, he made some good decisions, but uh, clearly there was extensive data that the pandemic was not going away. And he did not use the data. He just went with his feelings that this is going to be not going to go away. So this is about when to maximize the quality of your decision. You can learn how to, when your gut will lead you in the wrong direction. And then you'll make much better decisions regardless of whether you use your gut in some instances or not. So to what you're saying, Andrew, is very correct. You can address these cognitive biases, look at the assessment, see, hey, these are the most common tendencies where we're going wrong and then address these tendencies. And then you will make better in investment decisions and you'll be much more likely to be around for the next 70 years. <laughs> My kids will, I hope. Your kids, <laughs> of course. The company will and your kids. Yep. <laughs> okay. Uh, do we have to jump out here and get back into the... It'll automatically jump out in about oh, okay. hours, 20 seconds. 20 seconds, okay. Yeah, so any other final thoughts that you have, that's cool. Anybody? No. Cool. All right. Okay.
All right, folks, so, some insights as a result of the discussion that you've had. You can unmute yourself or you can use chat, whatever is most comfortable for you. Well, I think I think uh, Dr. Glenn out of our group, um, I think there, there's there's some thought around the idea that, you know, we might use the expression "go with your gut," um, but it, but as as a normal processing, we're looking to identify, you know, a, a lot of um, a lot of data or information to help us make those decisions. Mm -hmm. But I think you know the, the idea of it becoming more of a conscious, be, having a conscious awareness mm -hmm. of this is uh, is definitely helpful. Excellent. I'm glad to hear it. And the phrase "going with your gut" is again harmful in a number of ways because. The, you confuse your feelings of being right for actually being right. You can fuse your feelings for confidence of this actually being the right path. And sometimes the path that we feel is the right path is actually the wrong path. So that's what you want to be wary of when you think about using your gut. Anyone else wants to share some insights that they gained from the discussion? Do you go into that in your book? Dr. Of course, Glenn. yeah, and uh, I you should be able to get, so I'll send you a digital copy of the book and you should also get a physical copy that I assigned. So yes, I do go into that. Mm -hmm. So uh, Dr. Glenn, are you saying that going with your gut is wrong all the time or going with your gut is wrong some of the time? Going with your gut is wrong some of the time. The basic principle of trusting your gut, simply trusting it and feeling that, hey, when my gut, when I feel, you know, a certain thing, then that's what I should go with. You want to check with your head before trusting your gut. Because sometimes your gut is going to be absolutely right and sometimes it's going to be absolutely wrong. But you should not simply yeah. trust the feeling of this right. is the right thing and then therefore but, this is the right information. This is Therefore, this is the right decision. No, no, I but agree with that. I mean, about it, okay, sorry, one person sorry, at a time. You're talking about it as if this was a binary issue. My gut has evolved. My gut decisions get to be smarter over time because I incorporate, mm -hmm. you know, identifying some of the biases and some of the other lessons learned. Mm -hmm. So a gut decision I'm making in 2021 is going to be different than what I made in 2011. You're absolutely right, Mark. And so here we're talking about the difference between gut and expertise, gut and experience. Your gut decision-making is not your learned behaviors. Behaviors that you learned over time, like about these cognitive biases, that's not your gut, that's not your intuition, that's not the tribal brain. That's something that you learned over time and you've learned, aha, these are mistakes I tend to make or people at my company tend to make. This is something I'm now aware of and I'm watching out for it and I'm incorporating it into my decision-making. That's not your gut talking. That's learned behaviors where you learned that, hey, these sort of intuitive, these things that feel right for your 2011 self are actually, from your perspective back now, are actually not right. <laughs> so you've learned that those sorts of decisions are not to be trusted. And you wanna be careful about where you use your experience because we often have a sense that hey, our, my experience is great for all areas of business, but it's not going to serve us well in new situations like with the pandemic. So you wanna be able to tell, and I talk about this in the book in much more depth, you wanna be able to tell when is there a new situation and when should I be able to not go with my gut and gather the data more versus when is a situation you know, the same as I've seen it a hundred times before. <laughs> and therefore I can trust my, learned behaviors. You've probably heard that it takes about 10,000 hours of practice to become a master at something. And that's kind of the, it, it doesn't necessarily take 10,000 hours, but that's something that you want to be thinking about. An area where you have a lot of practice getting effective and correct results and immediate feedback on whether you got them right or not. Those are areas where you can trust your learned expertise quite a bit more. It'll be interesting to see in the book. And I think we're almost out of time, right? We have uh, five to six only. Yeah, we have, we have uh, five more minutes. So let me talk about the, I'll, I'll get to the final questions and answers, but these are the free resources that you'll get after the presentation. The assessment on dangerous judgment errors in the workplace, the manual on defending your future, 
a digital version of my best-selling book called Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions to Avoid Business Disasters. You'll also get a paper version and a coaching ses session for free open slots. So first come, first serve, I'll send you an email and whoever books with me first, that those will be that. So Paul, let me run a poll on the resources. So would you like the free post talk resources? Because obviously EO is an opt-in tool. So please vote. And then we'll have a few more seconds, a few more minutes for the final questions. And while you're voting, feel free to ask questions. We still have a few minutes. Well, I think you still, you definitely sparked you know, a, a little, a little controversy in this idea of going with your gut. I think, you know, uh, people clearly are, um, I think, trying to digest it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, it's something that, uh, again, for me, it's more about having a conscious awareness um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and going with those, the distinction between the two, I guess. Yeah. You want to be consciously aware when your gut is pointing you in a certain direction, and then you want to question with your head whether your gut is pointing you in the right direction or not, rather than simply, aha, uh -huh, my gut is pointing me in this direction, therefore it's the right direction. What do you say to, to folks, Dr. Glenn, when they actually overrode their gut and they made the wrong decision? So how, how of what, course what, will sometimes, what happens there? Yeah. <laughs> of course, will, sometimes you will make the wrong decision when you override your gut. The only thing you can do using effective decision-making techniques is maximize the chance of you making the right decision. You'll, you're never going, you know, anyone who guarantees you 100% being right is, you know, flee from that person because they're lying. <laughs> you, you can never guarantee, you know, the world is not under your control and you don't have full information. You know, the pandemic wiped out a whole bunch of good businesses that were otherwise making good decisions just because they happened to be in the hospitality or leisure industry. It, they might have been doing everything right, but just, you know, you can't predict those sort of thing. And you can't predict when a bus is going to hit you in the street, even though you're, you know, doing everything right, right? So the only thing you can do is maximize the likelihood of making a good decision. And going with your gut has been shown to really not maximize the likelihood of making a good decision. You want to use effective decision-making techniques, the ones I talk about, to do it so. Um, and asks, why wasn't average driver an option on the first question? Well, because it's just, are you in the bottom half or are you in the top half? I made the questionnaire the same as the researchers did who did the college survey. So I'm just using the research-based mechanism, the same one that they did for college students. Any other questions? Thoughts? I'm curious to see the, the distinction about the, the neuroscience behind that gut thing, because as entrepreneurs, you know, we like to think that we make these risky decisions and we do it so well, but I'm sure there's a, a very clear difference between making a, a gut decision and making one that's based on our previous successes yes. and mm -hmm. uh, what's worked out. So I'm curious to see, you know, the, the distinction, what, yep. what the different parts are. Happy to tell you. Yep. That's definitely the book talks about that. All right, everyone. So it seems that there are no further questions and I will be sending you the resources and whoever signs up for the first coaching sessions that are free available, you'll get that. All right, everyone. Thank well, you very much for a great day and yep. enjoy yourselves. Dr. Thank Glenn, you, Dr. I want to thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Carlo, for setting up. Thanks for our, our, our uh, supporters at City National Bank. We really appreciate you guys uh, showing yes. up as well as always. Thank you, Carlo. Carlo, uh, thank, thank you. you. Carlo. Bye, guys. Thank you, Carlo, for organizing. Thank you. Yep. We walk.